It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Martin Luther King Jr. Lecture this year. This evening, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Ebony Marshall Terman as our 2017 Martin Luther King Jr. Speaker. Dr. Terman is the Assistant Professor of Theology in African American Religion at Yale University Divinity School. She is a graduate of Fordham University and she holds an MDiv, a Master of Philosophy and a PhD from Union Theological Seminary in New York. She formerly served as Assistant Research Professor of Theological Ethics, Black Church Studies, and African and African American Studies, as well as the Director of the Black Church Studies Center at Duke Divinity School. Dr. Terman's most recent book is Toward a Womanist Ethic of Incarnation, Black Bodies, the Black Church, and the Council of Chalcedon. She is currently working on a new book tentatively titled Black Women's Burden, Sexism, Sacred Witness, and Transforming the Moral Life of the Black Church. As these titles suggest, her research and scholarship are focused on empowering and re-imaging the black church. Dr. Terman is unapologetically passionate about the black church and community. She is a refreshing addition to our most pressing national discussions of faith, race, and gender. We're honored to have her with us this evening. At the conclusion of this time, she'll take questions which will be moderated by the moderator of ABS, Sheena Rowley. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Marshall Terman? Thank you so much, President Barnes, for uh, that warm introduction and for hosting such a wonderful dinner this evening to uh, the faculty and staff who are gathered in this place tonight and to uh, especially the black students uh, um, by whom the invitation uh, from President Barnes was extended for me to be present with you tonight, uh, most especially Sheena and Kevin. Thank you for having me. Uh, I am delighted to be here and to share with you um, the beginnings of some thoughts that I am having uh, around um, the ethics of unfreedom and the aesthetics of invisibility. So tonight, I hope that you will think with me on the topic of men and mountaintops. Black Women, the Ethics of Unfreedom, and the Aesthetics of Invisibility in the Movement for Black Lives. In considering the approach of the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination, tonight I'd like to briefly look back to engage the iconic I Am a Man signs worn by strikers during the 1968 Memphis sanitation strike as a site of inquiry into what I have characterized as the aesthetic absurdity of black women's invisibility along the spectrum of the black freedom movement in the US. Even as the Memphis strike, which would be King's last campaign, is read adjacent to the backdrop of guiding meta-narratives of black bestiality and dishonorability that are consonant with US Slovocracy and its concomitant Jim Crow, which makes sense of and has made room for scholarly emphasis on the various meanings of the I am a man slogan um, toward the emphasis, in fact, of its gender neutrality as a call for human rights, the question remains for the black womanist ethical inquirer, what does the assertion of manhood as a politics of hope toward the approximation of black freedom actually accomplish? Does it uncover the desire of black men to access white cisgendered heteropatriarchy or does it do something else altogether? 
while asserting that freedom is the core of the prophetic black Christian tradition that propelled the Memphis event and that largely guided the moral compass of the late 20th century civil rights movement. Tonight, I am particularly interested in exploring the continuity between anti-blackness and patriarchy in church and society through an assertion of the moral paradox of sexism in the black church. Indeed, a paradox insofar as its institutional espousal of black freedom does not correspond with its regular practice of binding black women to sacralized politics of silence and invisibility. Rereading Memphis through a womanist historiographical lens that is always situated at the quadrilateral indices of race, gender, class, and sexual subordination, I'd like to contend the heterosexist cisgendered quality of black women's silent invisible bondage as a problematic sexual ethic that determines who gets to be on the mountain top, thrusting a narrative retelling of black freedom in the US that normatively erases or at least delegitimizes the import and significance of black women, that is your mama and mine, and the precision of their choreography of freedom that in many instances, like the Memphis strikes, propelled the movement. Engagement with a more recent icon of the Black Lives Matter movement as a 21st century iteration of the movement for black freedom that signifies this ain't yo mama civil rights movement, links past and present iconographic gestures of black freedom to paradoxically explore the aesthetic nuance of anti-black sexism. It asks, what does it mean for black women to be intracommunally disappeared in contrast to their spiritual and social witness? Following the lead of black feminist scholar Saidia Hartman, I wonder what becomes of freedom when the movement loses its mother? The paper gestures toward an assessment of uh, and constructive consideration of resistance against the ethics and aesthetics of black women's invisibility in church and society toward the reimagining of renewed moral life for black churches and communities. It gestures toward this, although time constraints will probably not allow a full discussion but perhaps considerations on this wise will be fruitful for our after discussion. Part one, I am a man. Martin Luther King Jr. and the Memphis strike. As noted in historian Michael K. Honey's Going Down Jericho Road, the Memphis strike, Martin Luther King's last campaign, the 1968 Memphis sanitation strikes mark one of the most significant turning points in the civil rights movement. Although often and hegemonically displaced by the more explicitly triumphant memories of the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, which regularly lends itself to a hagiographic remembering of a sanitized king's dream, and or the more tangible integrationist gains of the 1955 Montgomery bus boycott, the Memphis sanitation strike and its malodorous legacy of Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination in front of the Lorraine Motel's room 306, one of two hotels in the city of Memphis at that time that accommodated colored guests, leaves little room for a clean and cheerful ending. Its finale, that is, can never be separated from the blood of Martin Luther King Jr. or in the more precise words of philosopher Cornel West, from King's having been shot down like a dog on a Memphis balcony on his way to march with sanitation workers for labor and economic justice. In Memphis, February 1st, 1968, marked the beginning of King's End. On this rainy afternoon in the heart of the Mississippi River Delta, two young black sanitation workers, Robert Walker, 30, and Echo Cole, 36, were killed on the job after climbing inside of one of the sanitation division's wiener barrel trucks to ride out a Memphis rainstorm. Quote, on this particular day, Cole and Walker rode in a precarious stinking perch between a hydraulic ram used to mash garbage into a small wad 
and the wall of the truck's cavernous container. As crew chief Willie Crane drove the loaded garbage packer along Colonial Street to the Shelby Drive dump, he heard the hydraulic ram go into action. He pulled the truck over to the curb at 4.20 p.m., but the ram already was jamming coal and walker back into the compactor. One of the men lurched forward and nearly escaped, but the ram snagged his raincoat and dragged him back, end quote. It's worth noting that nearly every sanitation worker in the city of Memphis, except the supervisors, was black, and that four years prior to Cole and Walker's untimely death, two other sanitation workers had been killed due to faulty garbage trucks that the Memphis Department of Public Works refused to junk and replace. Malfunctioning garbage trucks were but one feature of the unsafe working conditions for black sanitation workers. It was compounded by the fact that while engaged in such putrefying and backbreaking work, the city did not provide them with gloves, uniforms, or a place to shower. Moreover, because black sanitation workers were categorized as unclassified hourly employees, beyond their insufficient hourly wages, they were ineligible to receive employee benefits, could be terminated without notice, and were regularly sent home without pay on rainy days. These poor working conditions that often qualified full-time dual-income black households, because black women, most of them, worked as domestics in white homes or in some other sector of the service economy, it qualified them dual-income households for welfare assistance. Combined with Walker and Cole's avoidable deaths, that left their respective already indigent families, that is their wives and children, unable to cover their final expenses. These things compelled the black sanitation workers to respond in kind to quote, white folks abuse, end quote. Abuse in the sanitation division and generations of white supremacy in Memphis. Without notice, on February 12th, 1968, the birthday of Abraham Lincoln, and just shy of two weeks following the deaths of their co-workers, nearly 1,300 black men in the Memphis Department of Public Works went on strike. Much to the chagrin of King's staff who begged him not to go to Memphis. Due to his several other organizing commitments, King first arrived there on Monday, March 18, 1968, understanding for himself that the Memphis strikers personified the plight of the black working poor that was the moral center of his poor people's campaign. Nearly 25,000 strikers who enfleshed what Honey designates as the spirit of Memphis, defined by unity, determination, and mass participation gathered at Mason Temple to hear King Stalwartly declare in continuity with the assembled working poor sanitation laborers that all labor has dignity. Quote, with one foot planted on the Bible and the other on the Constitution, King had long ago perfected a powerful oratory that matched the timing and the rhythm and the feelings and the needs of the Southern black working class. His rhetoric helped poor people get beyond feelings of despair, helplessness, and unworthiness, encouraged by lifetimes of poverty and racism. King confirmed for the masses that black poverty resulted not from people's lack of initiative or hard work, but from powerlessness inflicted by unjust structures of power. And King said that they could change all that, end quote. Thus, Echoing the I am a man placards worn by strikers amidst the chaos in the bluff city that would eventually devolve into a bevy of deadly violence on at the March 28th protest that in many ways parallels the anti-black state sanctioned and state sponsored violence that had historically haunted black Memphis living under the scourge of Jim Crow. King's rhetoric at the overflowing mass meetings emphasized the dignity and the humanity of the strikers and of all poor people in opposition to meta-narratives of black inferiority and dishonorability that too often framed what George M. Fredrickson so accurately identifies as the black image in the white mind and what womanist ethicist Emily M. Towns more recently characterizes as the fantastic hegemonic imagination. In spite of Henry Loeb's, Mayor Henry Loeb's plantation style paternalism that underscored his public designation of black Memphians as his Negroes 
in ways that eerily correspond with Donald J. Trump's recent designation of the one visible black person at one of his many presidential campaign rallies as my African American. Historian Steve Estes contends that the I am a man slogan that contemporarily functions as the black iconographic datum of the Memphis movement sampled from bluesman Muddy Waters' 1955 hit single, Mannish Boy, and first printed on placards by a white minister who cast his lot with the black poor, that is, Claiborne Temple's Reverend Malcolm Blackburn, that it stretched beyond the ideals of self-determination and citizenship, choice, and the right to organize, as so often espoused. Estes argues that in addition to such ideals, the I am a man placards simultaneously represented the striker's dispute with white male power over what it means to be a man. In other words, for as much as an inclusive humanist vision that defies binary models of gender identity can be read into the declaration that iconographically sits at and is unqualifiedly tied to the heart of the Memphis movement, Estes concedes that masculinity and the struggle for manhood in the ontic proclamation of such manhood is central to the sanitation workers' protest through the now iconic slogan, I am a man, and it cannot be overlooked. As is further and perhaps more interestingly contends that this ontic proclamation not only illuminates a spectrum of meaning for black manhood, but also raises significant questions about the position of women in the Memphis movement which lends itself to highlighting King's support for black patriarchy, making sense of his claim in Memphis that, quote, we are tired of Negro men being emasculated so that our wives and daughters have to go out and work in the white lady's kitchen, end quote. Estes explains at length, the male domination of the SCLC and the patriarchal order of the American society in the 1960s bolstered King's support for male-headed households and also his rhetoric of manhood. King's support for black patriarchy reflected the gender hierarchy within the black church and the SCLC. SCLC's direct action campaigns, nonviolent philosophy, and faith-based inspiration had won countless women supporters and staffers for the organization, but the organization's leadership ranks remained dominant, dominated by men. These were preachers accustomed to a world of congregations and choruses where women predominated, but men led." End quote. Said differently, for all the gender neutral intent typically ascribed to the proclamation as icon, I am a man begs a very straightforward question that echoes woman as sociologist of religion, Cheryl Townsend Jilk's classic study of black women's experience in church and community. What about the women? That is, what about the black women, many if not most of whom did in fact work as domestic laborers, but also did much more than that? Such inquiry might be contested on the grounds that the Memphis strike was propelled by the labor conditions of the all-male sanitation workers in ways that make sense of manhood and a masculinist moral scape as necessarily central to its appeal. Given the primary gender identity of the sanitation workers, it would be argued, it could be argued, that their assertions of manhood are properly situated, and perhaps they are. The questions that emerge for womanist ethical inquiry are not directed toward the veracity and or viability of ontic self-proclamation in the face of the threat of non-being. In fact, womanist ethical method privileges radical subjectivity as the first tenet of its constructive theological and ethical task. That said, this project is not about hating on black men, which is a familiar intercommunal charge against black womanist thought, especially as it endeavors to interrogate the moral managers of the prophetic black Christian tradition. Instead, it is primarily concerned with the qualitative measure of manhood, its gendered implications, and the how of its situatedness in relationship to the women whose lives and life chances in this instance were equally circumscribed by the racist and economically unjust labor practices that precipitated the Memphis campaign, as well as they were multilaterally jeopardized by the realities of gender subordination. A womanist hermeneutics of identification ascertainment 
as it is appropriated from theologian Dolores S. Williams' Hageritic task, compels the uncovering of women's stories that are typically elided by the insidious nature of binary gender hierarchy. It asks of the Memphis civil rights icon, who were the women involved in the 1968 strike? What happened to the wives of Robert Walker and Echo Cole, who could not afford to bury their husbands? How did the women manage to sustain their homes economically on meager domestic salaries as black dual income households were under siege by Loeb and the city council's obstinate opposition? Maxine Smith is rarely highlighted as the direct Memphis connection to King beyond James Lawson, who was at the time a Memphis transplant. Smith first met King when she was a student at Spelman College and he a quiet, unassuming student at Morehouse. What about Lori Sugarman, Phi Beta Kappa from Wellesley College, who along with Smith earned a master's degree from Middlebury College in Vermont before going on to earn the degree of Doctor of Philosophy at Johns Hopkins University after being denied at Memphis, admittance to Memphis State. In 1959, both Smith and Sugarman would go on to sue and defeat segregation at Memphis State University, and together through their club work, would build the membership of the Memphis NAACP into the largest in the South, so that black Memphis was primed to fuel the labor and civil rights movements to emerge from the sanitation strike in, late in the late 1960s. Or what about Cornelia Crenshaw, who worked as a manager at the Memphis Housing Authority for more than 27 years as one of the few black women in city employment with a white collar job, contending that women proved to be as strong as the men in supporting the strike. Honey posits, quote, Cornelia Crenshaw began recruiting women as typists, telephone callers, picketers, and fundraisers. She worked late into the night making sure the workers' families, some of whom had as many as 18 children, received food and financial support. Or how about the poor black women strikers who worked at the Scripto Pen and Pencil Factory in 1964 Atlanta, making $400 less than the minimal poverty level for full-time work. Women, poor black women, who caught the attention of King by way of C.T. Vivian, the director of the, the SCLC affiliates. The labor and resistance of these black women strikers in Atlanta four years before the sanitation workers would strike in Memphis helped crystallize for King the need to connect the demands of labor and civil rights that would become the catalyst for his poor people's campaign for economic justice that eventually led him to Memphis in the first place. What about these women? Not to mention the direct link that must be made between the urgency of King's Memphis detour and the fact that it was Gladys Carpenter, a veteran marcher who had participated in the 1965 Selma to Montgomery march and James Meredith's deadly 1966 march against fear from Memphis to Jackson that was billed as for black men only. It was Gladys Carpenter whose foot was run over by a police car being used as a weapon during one of the first strike marches. Her cry, he runned over my foot, launched the first direct acts of police retaliation against the Memphis movement that would ultimately compel King further down his Jericho Road. Part two, I'm not fearing any man. The disappearance or silent invisibilization of these women and so many others who will forever remain nameless in the annals of history is not a coincidence. In chapter four of my book, Toward a Womanist Ethic of Incarnation, Black Bodies, the Black Church, and the Council of Chalcedon, I discuss at length what I have identified as the moral problem of making men that emerges from the particularity of black social gospel methodology honed at the University of Chicago and propagated through the moral lenses and institutional legacies of, for example, Benjamin Elijah Mays, who was the president of Morehouse College during King's time there as a student, as well as his mentor and friend throughout King's adult life. In short, I argue that the prophets, P-R-O-F-I-T-S, of black manhood 
rather the prophets of manhood, namely a self-determined humanity that freely authors its own liberation in opposition to, quote, subservience, obsequiousness, adjustment to little or nothing, the swallowing of insults and low-paying jobs, end quote, permanently elude black women because its conferral is first dependent on male embodied normativity. Maleness here always requires aspiration to, at least, the heteropatriarchal assumptions of white male power with devastating effects on black women insofar as these assumptions are always inclusive of anti-black sexism and its often concurrent misogynoir, even as they are shared by men as different as Martin King and Daniel Patrick Moynihan, men as different as Malcolm X and Donald Trump. In interrogating the icon of the Memphis campaign through black patriarchal rhetoric and praxis as it can be identified in King's witness, I'm attempting to uncover the complexities of black women's oppression, namely the ethics of unfreedom or black women's bondage to anti-black sexism that both erases them from history and delegitimizes the value of their contemporary work. The problem is that black women's unfreedom is central, though not intrinsic, and we'll return to that in a minute, but it is central to the black prophetic project of freedom. A project, I'm gonna say that again, because that's very important. The problem is, that black women's unfreedom is central, though not intrinsic, it is central to the black prophetic project of freedom. A project that is employed in church, academy, and society as a beacon for the work of justice making. I'm asserting then the profoundly problematic reality of justice making that demands black women's subordination and or the disappearing of black women through narratives that silence and invisibilize as if echoing womanist ethicist Katie G. Cannon, the black woman's story is not true, that they weren't there, that they didn't exist, that they did not contribute meaningfully such disappearing acts are most often made visible in the triangulation of black women's oppression insofar as they are circumscribed by white men, black men, and white women. When white men, black men, and white women get together, notice where black women and other women of color are situated in relationship to their leadership paradigms. They are typically not there even as claims of diversity and justice can be espoused based on the inclusion of racialized and gender subordinates, respectively, black men on the one hand, white women on the other, diversity. What I am trying to get to here through Memphis is more about us than about King. That is the moral failure that attends the configuration and remembering of black ethical and political leadership in church and society. And perhaps even more, the moral failure that attends the configuration and remembering of black humanity, insofar as Hortense Spillers asserts that the black female subject is perceived as the principal point of passage between the human and the non-human world, the route by which the dominant modes decided the distinction between humanity and the other. Liberating visions of the gendered aesthetic and influence of black leadership propagated by black radical liberationists and even evangelical traditions, as well as by whites, more specifically white men, who are oriented toward getting the race question right without attending to the criticality of intersectionality and assemblage, always at stake for, as Jacqueline Grant argued, the slave of slaves, binds black women to debilitating social subordination rooted in Victorian sexual propriety, which demands that men be on top with no questions asked, which is its own form of violence. This theological dilemma and ecclesial paradox formally compelled womanist theological imagination to contend 
in defiance of the black and feminist liberationist theological projects, that God does not liberate everybody. And neither does King. Even as the meta narrative of his unquestionably vital, world transforming, and enduring work for which his life was taken suggests otherwise, King may not be the key to black liberation, as indicated by the 21st century movement for black lives manifesting now in Black Lives Matter. He may not be the key. I know this is the King's King lecture, it could be the Ella Baker lecture, it could be, this is the King lecture but he may not be the key. And until we get that straight, insofar as the veneration of King's much celebrated heteropatriarchy paradoxically runs through prophetic black Christian social and ecclesial commitments, black women and our sexually minoritized queer kin will continue to be disappeared by the mountaintops of masculinist history that embrace the notion that, quote, men are more powerful than women, that men preach stronger than women, that men should have control and authority over women's lives in ways that too often abandon black women quite literally to the missionary position. <laughs> the ethics of unfreedom the ethics of unfreedom that circumscribe the lives of black women are consistently evident in the contemporary black church. It should be noted that black churches are not homogenous and not every black church is circumscribed by sexual gender injustice that targets black women and black girls, although I would argue based on ethnographic data that too many actually are. As I've indicated elsewhere, my use of the black church as a rhetorical device does not endeavor to minimize the significant varieties of religious epistemology, denominational polity, and communal praxis that guide the ecclesial practice of Christian persons and communities of African descent in the US. It rather signifies the historical continuity and expression of black Christian faith that is no greater than the sum of its varied parts accordingly. The black church does not only refer to the seven primary, primary historically black Christian denominations, African Methodist Episcopal, African Methodist Episcopal Zion, Christian Methodist Episcopal, Church of God in Christ, National Baptist Convention of America, National Baptist Convention USA Incorporated, and the Pro Progressive National Baptist Convention Incor Incorporated. It also includes those smaller historically black denominations like the Sanctified Church, also known as the Church of God, the United Holy Church of America, and the Fire Baptized Holiness Church of God of the Americas. In addition to those primarily black congregations in historically white majoritized denominations like the American Baptist Churches USA, the Anglican Episcopal Church, and the United Methodist Church, as well as multicultural non-denominational churches whose liturgical expressions are primarily guided by the norms of African-American preaching and worship traditions. What is most interesting about the prominence of sexual gender injustice in black churches is that the black church is an institution that emerged, was born at the interstices of abolition and enslavement in rebellion against body injustice that branded blackness as abhorrent. Considerable attention has been given to the implications of race, racialization, and the effects of racism in and upon black churches. However, the intersection of race and gender in the black church has been largely overlooked. Although black women comprise approximately 82% of the contemporary black church, they have become invisible, they are invisibilized by a peculiar variety of body injustice that paradoxically guides the ethos of the black church tradition and that begets its moral corruption. The black woman's body, not necessarily her labor, her financial currency, or her spiritual creativity, but her body as the enfleshment of triune jeopardy, as it is race, gendered, and classed all at the same time as subordinate, has historically posed a problem for and in the black church. Her mere presence defies and disrupts the monotony of male normativity that has been elevated in black churches according to the logics of white supremacy and male superiority. Racialized sexism, 
which constitutes the ethics of unfreedom in which both men and women participate is the primary obstacle to authentic justice for black women in church and society. Not only does it restrict black women's equal access to pastoral and lay leadership, it also discourages them from fully endeavoring to formally affirm their vocational call to ordained ministry. Moreover, black women, clergy, and lay alike bear the brunt of sexism in the black church on their bodies and are consistently required to negotiate the politics of labor exploitation in subaltern sacred economies that encourage them to embody Pauline doulos as proof, visible affirmation of their status as invisible volunteers, yes. stipend staffers, yes. and silently suffering servants. Yes. Meanwhile, their heteronormative male counterparts are often visible, better paid, and regularly audible. Additionally, the psyches of black women are battered by the unspoken scandal of gender tokenism where the presence of one black clergywoman with no power vindicates the pulpit from the charge and guilt of patriarchy. Even more embarrassing and pertinent to this conversation is the reality that black women are confronted by a distinct misogynoiristic body hate that materializes in the imposed, that's the key word, cover up that has been instituted in the demonizing phenomenon of lap scarves, turtlenecks, and pantyhose all of which remixes an insidious social construction of gender mythology that replays an old story of a hybrid black mammy Jezebel every time. How can you be both, mammy and Jezebel? Although in the past 10 to 15 years, the black church has seen a remarkable uptick in the number of women in pastoral and or ministerial leadership positions, as is evidenced by black women's disproportionate misrepresentation, or rather their relative absence, to be more precise from the highest levels of Afroclesial leadership when compared to the church's majority female constituency, a large proportion of black churches continues to continue to prohibit black women from exercising the arts and gifts of ministry from the pulpit. In fact, in recounting this black church reality, I distinctly remember my own experience as a licensed and ordained minister in the National Baptist Convention, USA, Incorporated, as well as a theological educator. I've been instructed on several occasions to address congregations from the floor, while the platform of black male ministers ascended toward the sacred desk. The masculine erection of the pulpit that notably defies black church origins as slave religion but gets the sort of sexual gender discrimination that regularly excludes women from ordained ministry and restricts them to lay service, like teaching in the Sunday school, singing in the choir, answering the phones and cooking in the kitchen, all of which are no doubt significant service that often constitute the principal viability of a congregation and concretely serve, at least serves at least two of the three tables of an ordained, though typically male, diaconate. Sexism in the black church, moreover, does not commence in adulthood when and if one approximates sacred consciousness and the courage to affirm call. To the contrary, the effects of sexual gender discrimination in the black church begin taking hold in childhood, wherein those identified as girls are often conditioned into a gendered variation of Du Boisian double consciousness that functions accordingly as two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals, in one black woman child's body that is concurrently both image of God and female subject to men, echoing an Augustinian designation of women as special symbols of evil and to mystic regard for women as defective and misbegotten. Indeed, in the alleged safety of the black church, one ever feels her two-ness. As I note in my forthcoming book, Black Women's Burden, Sexism, Sacred Witness, and Transforming the Moral Life of the Black Church, strong arguments can be made about the social and psychological effects that black women's invisibilization, their disappearing, their marginalization in the church, not just in the history books, but in the church has, as well as the paralyzing spiritual trauma that accompanies preaching misogyny from the pulpit in ways that insult shame and spiritually wound. These sorts of hostile and discriminating liturgical practices have been notably recognized in, for example, the Reverend Jamal Harrison Bryant's impertinent reprimand of disloyal hoes in his now infamous sermon, I'm My Enemy's Worst Nightmare, 
preached at the Empowerment Temple AME Church in Baltimore, Maryland, where he is senior pastor. Surprisingly, even the contemporary black social gospeler, the Reverend Calvin Otis Butts III, and his homiletical association between Hosea's whore and the Lenox Avenue Ho, in a sermon delivered at the historic Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, where he is senior pastor, is likewise hermeneutically slothful and deeply problematic. Similarly, Juanita Bynum's recent viral soliloquy concerning the necessity of black women combining their ho with God's lee toward the approximation of divine holiness is one example of the ways in which black women participate in their own subjection through the performance of patriarchy in drag. The corresponding demonization of black girls' bodies in the black church, however, is equally intriguing insofar as it situates their bodies apart from their practices on a moral fault line. In this way, the black church as a supportive institution that is supportive of what woman and systematic theologian Kelly Brown Douglas asserts as the white cultural attack and what black feminist anti-colonial geographer Catherine McKittrick identifies as state-sanctioned human geographies that displace and dispossess targets not only what black women and girls do, but also who black women and girls inherently are in service to a top-down binary gender hierarchy that upholds male power. The main point here is to demonstrate the now textures of black women's suppression, repression, and oppression according to the intercommunal logics of unfreedom ascribed to black women because they are not made men. This is your mama's movement. Despite their consistent marginalization in African-American churches, black women and sexual minorities have cultivated sacred spaces within and outside of the black church in salvific ways. Concentrated interrogation of the historical record, as with Memphis, indicates that black activist women of faith across the ages have been concerned with both racial and gender justice, especially with respect to uplifting black women and those they love. In fact, even as, they often, even as they are often disappeared from a normative retelling of the spectrum of the black freedom movement, their model of faith in action conceived the substance of black womanism as an intellectual practice and theological task. The spirituality and social witness of black women like Jarena Lee, Ida B. Wells Barnett, Mariah Stewart, Anna Julia Cooper, among others, paved the way for the non-traditional as it relates to age, gender, sexuality, and institutional affiliation assembly of millennial freedom fighters that is most contemporarily identifiable as the Black Lives Matter movement. A movement that is oriented toward justice for black lives and that was born of the ethical imaginations of black queer women, Patrice Cullors, Alicia Garza, and Opal Tometi. Women, not made men, who embody the intersectional identity that is the incarnate aggregation of generational gender and sexual disrespectability in the institutional black church. Although defying the masculinism that consistently guides inquiry into the phenomenon of black freedom, these young women's social commitment to the redemption of subjugated black bodies mirrors the moral scape that gave birth to the black church in America in opposition to the church's betrayal of black life especially black women's lives, as noted above, by way of its discriminative intra-ecclesial ethics of unfreedom, like sexism, generationalism, homophobia, and cisnormativity that lend themselves to black women's bondage and intracommunal fragmentation. Constituted by a diverse range of religious and non-theistic co contributors, the contemporary Black Lives Matter movement transgresses the boundaries of any one dogmatic confession it is grounded instead in praxeological commitments that resonate with the ethical ministry of Jesus to the poor and the oppressed as illuminated by a liberationist hermeneutic of the gospel of Luke, not John, to my brother, 416, which establishes the proclamation of the good news to the poor as the actionable and explicit mission of God in Christ. Direct action and social media engagement enliven the contemporary justice making good news that affirms, despite their sociological dispossession, that all black lives matter. It additionally exhorts communities of African descent in America 
to stay woke in the face of sunken place meta-narratives of black pathology and criminality that broadly attempt to justify and or conceal death-dealing machinations of race, gender, class, and sexual hierarchies. In much the same way that the early civil rights movement was rejected by many black preachers and churches throughout the nation, prompting, the fact, prompting in fact the 1961 splintering of the National Baptist Convention USA Incorporated, the largest gathering of black Baptists in the world at that time, many contemporary black churches have similarly spurned the Black Lives Matter movement, which is particularly interesting when we think, uh, when we think about Black Lives Matter in relationship to the Memphis campaign because the Memphis campaign was also characterized by deep division between, as King's last campaign, between kind of the young revolutionaries known as the invaders in the Memphis community and kind of the, the um, for lack of a better word, old guard. Black churches have similarly spurned the Black Lives Matter movement. The movement's radical disruption of the dominion of the older, male, publicly heterosexual black preacher class is typically charged with threatening the stronghold of black church respectability in its seizure of the future of black life from the everydayness of black death. Black Lives Matter situates the redemptive potential of African America, not merely in the illusion of the respectability of integration with white America, which based on the everydayness of contemporary anti-black violence is in and of itself morally inept because, well, whatever. This African-American moral vision of justice is primarily informed by the righteous, I mean, how's it really worked out for us, right? Okay. This African-American moral vision of justice is primarily informed by the righteous indignation that emerges from the incessant dispossession of those who disproportionately live and die on the margins of church, academy, and society. Black Lives Matter unqualifiedly asserts that the liberating power of radical self-love and justice is born not from the quiver of the greatest among us, but from the passionate ingenuity of the least of these, who as brazenly pronounced in Ferguson are young and strong and march all night long in defiance of regulating curfews, tear gas, guns, tasers, and even the now time-worn threat of police dogs, all of which, except for the police dogs, um, were used in Memphis. There they use police cars. All of this, and then some, makes even more intriguing and deeply problematic what I judge to be two of the more prominent icons of the contemporary movement for black lives that participate in the aesthetics of black women's invisibility, typically found on t-shirts as a remixed 21st century placard, reminiscent of the Memphis strikes, I am a man, that now read, on the one hand, I am not my grandparents, you will catch these hands. And on the other, and more pertinent to our discussion tonight, this ain't your mama's civil rights movement. Submitting, it seems, perfectly to the hegemony of what Hartman identifies as the will to forget that guides historical narratives that typically disappear the import of black women from the black freedom struggle. This ain't your mama's civil rights movement as a 21st century Black Lives Matter movement icon functions then in consonance with the patriarchal gendered quality of the I am a man placard as it invisibilizes the import of black women's significant participation and leadership on the spectrum of black freedom and secondarily crushes the potential of black women's ontic capacity to a movement that they supposedly were not there for in the first place except for the brief transportation excursus on a Montgomery bus, depending on who tells the story. The rich tradition of black women's resistance in the US, however, suggests that like Christian iconography's white Jesus, this ain't your mama's civil rights movement as an icon of the contemporary movement for black lives is a lie. One so insidious that it gives rise to the circuity of injustice within liberationist context that sacralizes losing our mothers toward the end of justice making. You see how this thing works over and over and over again? To the contrary, womanist theoethical inquiry decidedly asserts that black women's lives matter 
and that there is dramatic continuity between Black Lives Matter and our mother's civil rights movement. The phenomenon of making men has dictated that male lives and male bodies, like King, are more valuable than women's lives and women's bodies. And yet we find black women now as then, who are the progenitors, the mobilizers, and the sustainers of the movement for black freedom. Even as black women participate themselves in self-sarcographic, that is self-cannibalizing practices, as was the case with the civil rights movement of the 20th century and the calls for abolition in the 18th and 19th centuries, black women continue to shape and articulate the significance of the contemporary movement for black lives. Black women, we know, created the hashtag as a political intervention in a social context where black life is consistently profiled and targeted. Sinead Nichols and Umara Elliott, black women, Organize the Millions March New York City in response to the choking death of Eric Garner. Ashley Yates, Alexis Templeton, and Brittany Farrell, black women, founded Millennial Activists United in Ferguson, Missouri after the shooting death of Michael Brown. Black women, like Afro-Latina, like Carmen Perez, executive director of the Gathering for Justice, organized Black Lives Matter's largest and highest profile die-in to date at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, New York. These young black women are our contemporary Fannie Lou Hamers, our September points at Clark's, our Rosa Parks, our Asada Shakurs, our Joanne Gibson Robinsons, our Claudette Colvins, our Ella Bakers, our Mahalia Jacksons, and our Prathia Halls, who when Martin Luther King Jr. was failing miserably in his shining moment at the Lincoln Memorial, whisper to him, tell them about the dream, Martin. But because black women's bodies sit at the intersection of racialized subjugation on the one hand and gendered subjugation on the other, their experiences and distinct contributions are not only marginalized and caricatured, but often rendered fictitious and thus disappeared as if black women do not know for themselves that their stories are indeed true a hermeneutical excursus toward a womanist ethic of freedom. It could be argued that the primary motivation of black women to lead and participate in the movement for black lives, at least the contemporary movement for black lives, is the threat of non-being that haunts their sons, their brothers, their husbands and their fathers and their friends as they are killed according to slavocratic logics of state-sanctioned and state-sponsored violence that renders black men as not man insofar as he deviates from white male aspiration. Y'all will catch that later. <laughs> which is true. And which makes some sense of the confession, I am a man. But it is also true that black women are numbered as the poorest of the poor in the world. Yes, yes. It's also true that black women are incarcerated at rates three times higher than their white counterparts. Yes. It's also true that black women themselves are being killed at disproportionate and alarming rates by and alongside black men yes. and black children at the interstices of anti-black racism and anti-black sexism. In the face of such devastation, womanist theology and ethics born from the resistance traditions of women of black African descent in America vigorously fight for the wellness and wholeness of the entire community by rejecting mountaintop liberationist paradigms that only allow for one kind of body to see the promised land. Instead, it boldly asserts with contemporary flair that Black Lives Matter, all of them, male, female, and non-conforming, poor, rich, and the rest of us, dark skin, brown skin, light skin, queer, straight, bi, and trans. To suggest otherwise, perhaps that straight black men's lives matter is nothing more than the movement's holdover of black patriarchy to be resisted at all costs. 
To counter that all lives matter is to express post-racial racism that obscures the fact that all lives are not threatened by state-sanctioned, academy-sanctioned, and church-sanctioned violence. It reveals an underlying post-racial negrophobia that resists the affirmation of black life. This sort of semantic anti-black violence rationalizes all lives matter is anti-black violence. It rationalizes the disappearing of black people who walk while black, drive while black, play while black, sleep while black, go to the store while black, walk downstairs while black, visit friends while black, teach while black, go to school while black, preach while being both black and woman. It plunders in accordance with the ethics of unfreedom and the aesthetics of invisibility, the intellectual property of black women who first said that black lives matter, period. And it dismisses the historical pattern that shows us, as Alicia Garza pointed out in her beautifully crafted essay, a her story of the Black Lives Matter movement, that when black people, because contrary to normative images of womanhood, all the women are not white. And contrary to popular racial imagination, all the blacks are not men. But when black people get free, there is potential for all people to get free. In this essay, I have attempted to employ Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s last campaign in 1968 Memphis, more specifically, the I Am A Man placards worn by sanitation strikers as a primary site of inquiry that supports thinking about anti-black sexism in the black church and in the iconographic efforts of the contemporary movement for black lives. This linking of the inherent continuities between King's Memphis legacy the black church, and the spectrum of the black freedom movement in the US that is inclusive of Black Lives Matter toward the end of dismantling sexism in the black church and community has further endeavored to privilege black women as theological and ethical methods as primary resources for dismantling the ethics of black women's unfreedom, for dismantling the aesthetics of black women's invisibility, and for the constructive and ever-present task of approximating black freedom now. Thank you.